This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. All right. Um, well, thanks for coming. Uh, so I want to talk uh, today a little bit about uh, black hole entropy and uh, holographic entropy bounds in general space times. Um, and hopefully, if I get to it, about uh, the more general connection between energy and space and quantum information that, um, that we've come to recognize over the years, that that was really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and now we're exploring the rest of the iceberg. So uh, in, in my talk, as I think in most people's talks, the speed of light will be one, and Boltzmann's constant will be one. But, um, but I will try to keep Newton's constant and uh, Planck's constant explicit uh, in most formulas, unless I forget, uh, because it's actually important to keep track. Uh, in particular, it's important to recognize which formulas have gravity in them and which seemingly do not. Okay. Um, and feel free to ask me questions anytime. Okay. So um, I want to start the story. Uh, this, this, is, this is one topic where I think it's, it's actually convenient to start historically. Um, and, so, and so I'll start with Bekenstein. Um, who uh, asked himself, or maybe his, actually his PhD advisor asked him to answer the following question. So, um, so here's a black hole. And uh, here is a box containing gas or maybe radiation or something at some temperature. And so this box has some entropy S, some thermodynamic entropy S. Um, and maybe there's other stuff, it won't matter. And then there's an observer here. And um, what they asked, the question that they asked is, what if we throw this entropy into the black hole? And uh, more specifically, what happens to the generalized second law, excuse me, to the second law of thermodynamics? Um, so the second law, of course, says that the entropy content cannot uh, decrease. But here it looks like I can take some entropy and destroy it by throwing it into the black hole. Now, if you find this argument for worrying about this, if you find that unconvincing, I think you're right. It's actually a really strange thing to worry about. Because what is the problem, right? So the box is now inside the black hole. Um, it's not clear that this is something that we should lose any sleep over. You know, what if I throw my box into, into, I don't know, the Grand Canyon? It's also hard to get to it that way. But that doesn't mean that I start worrying about whether the second law of thermodynamics was violated. Now, a black hole is a little bit worse than the Grand Canyon. Um, it's worse because if you jump into the black hole to go look at your box, uh, you won't find it there anymore. In the space-time diagram, this, this picture looks as follows. Here's the black hole. So this is a Penrose diagram. If you don't know exactly what those are, light travels at 45 degrees is the important thing. Okay, and then what you do is you rescale the space-time in such a way that, um, that infinities get shrunk down to finite distance, and uh, points represent spheres. And if you have a singularity, it gets blown up in such a way that you can see that, for example, the singularity inside the black hole is actually an endpoint uh, of world lines. It's not, it's not a place, it's a moment in time. Okay. So, so here's your box. It went into this black hole. Uh, and here's our observer, desperate to catch up with his box. Uh, let's see. So, so the observer has been hovering out there at some large radius. And, and now he wants to go see his box, so he, he also jumps into the black hole. But even moving at almost the speed of light, it's clear that he cannot make contact with the box. In fact, the more detailed calculation will tell you that even if the box sends out signals, uh, those cannot reach that observer because they get, they get uh, redshifted so enormously that, that you'd have to send a, a signal with more energy than the whole black hole for, a, for an observer at this later time to still be able to receive it. And the relevant time scale here, by the way, is what's called the scrambling time. So I'm, I'm simply reporting here. Um, 
the result of a re relatively straightforward calculation that you can check yourself. I'm not, it's not supposed to be obvious why this is true, but if you take the Schwarzschild geometry and do the calculation, you'll find that, that there's, there's really no way that you can see any, any remainders of your box if you, if you jump into the black hole much later. And, and so perhaps for those reasons, uh, it was right to, to, to worry about, or it was understandable that he worried about this problem. He was worried, in other words, that um, the second law would be meaningless to an outside observer. If you don't know if black holes form in your lab or not, you know, if, if the second law is violated, you can just say, oh, well, maybe a black hole ate the entropy. Right? So, so then the, the, it, it becomes sort of meaningless to talk about it, and that bothered them. So they wanted this situation uh, to still correspond to some sort of meaningful application of the second law. Um, and, so, and so Beckenstein decided that black holes themselves must have some kind of entropy. He decided that the way that this gets resolved is similar to when you put a hot cup of tea in your fridge. The tea entropy goes down, but overall there's something else. The, the black hole heats the air of the room and the entropy of the room goes up by more than enough to compensate for this lost entropy. And so here, what Beckenstein proposed is that um, black holes have entropy. Now, what's the amount of entropy? Well, this, the sensible thing to guess uh, was, well, the area. Because in 1971, Hawking had just proven um, that the area of event horizons uh, cannot decrease in general relativity if you assume, roughly speaking, speaking that matter has positive energy. Uh, for something like a Schwarzschild black hole, that's kind of obvious. If you just add mass to a Schwarzschild black hole, well, the area is proportional to the mass squared. And so, of course, the area will increase if you throw positive stuff in, uh, positive mass stuff in. It's less obvious when you have rotating black holes or when you have mergers of multiple black holes, but the upshot is the total uh, horizon area will not decrease in any such processes, and you can prove it as a mathematical theorem in general relativity. Uh, again, assuming that this condition holds for matter where T mu nu is the stress tensor and K is a null vector along the horizon of the black hole. Okay. So um, this is called the null energy condition, by the way. It's going to be important later. Okay. Um, so, so this was Beckenstein's inspiration to say, well, why don't we just say that black holes have an entropy proportional to their area, since the area already has this sort of entropy-like behavior built into it. Could have been some positive power of the area or some other monotonic function of the area, but that was the simplest guess. Now, again, th this, this is... It's quite a drastic step to take. Um, some things don't fit here. This is a mathematical theorem. Within general relativity, assuming this condition, it is a certainty that the, end, that the area does not decrease, the area of all the event horizons in your spacetime. But, um, but the second law is a statistical statement. It's just very, very unlikely for this to be violated. It's something that becomes exact in the limit where your systems have infinitely many degrees of freedom. So it was, it was quite a crazy guess, actually. But, but this was his guess. And then in order to make this dimensionally correct, you have to divide by something that has dimension area. Well, it turns out that Newton's constant times Planck's constant has that dimension. That's the Planck area squared right here. Planck length is about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So let's write this down. And um, that's, that's what he could do. He figured there would be some order one number here, but he didn't know what it was. Um, but, but fortunately, it was, it was fixed later. So um, here's another crazy thing about his proposal. Um, his proposal meant that if black holes have entropy and if they have a temperature, then the first law of thermodynamics tells you 
uh, sorry, if they have entropy and they have energy, which they do because they have mass, then, then by the first law of thermodynamics, they have to have a temperature. Those two things are, those three quantities are connected. And if they have a temperature, then they should radiate. And uh, the idea that black holes radiate was pretty absurd because they are those things that nothing comes out of, so how could they radiate? Of course, that's a false objection because Bekenstein was making a statement about quantum mechanics. And the idea that black holes cannot emit anything comes from classical general relativity. But still, that proved psychologically, I guess, uh, um, to be a real obstruction to people accepting Bekenstein's idea. For example, Hawking didn't like it at all. He didn't think that black holes really have entropy, because in that case, they'd have to radiate. Then in 1974, uh, Hawking did some completely unrelated calculation um, and found that black holes do, in fact, radiate. At some temperature that's of order, um, that's of order the inverse size of the black hole. Okay, and um, that was great. Now everything fell into place, and in fact, you could use Hawking's calculation and work backwards using the first law of thermodynamics to fix this coefficient here to be a four or one quarter. So that's great, everything fit nicely together. But let's get back to, um, let's get back to Bekenstein and what he was really trying to say. Okay. So, what he was really trying to say is that we have to replace our notion of just matter entropy with something that he called generalized entropy, which includes also the contribution from black holes. So here by S out, I mean the entropy of the matter outside of, um, outside of the black hole. Okay. And in fact, I'm going to write this as a, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the area here explicitly. This is a very important formula. Okay, so that's the actual entropy that we're dealing with. And um, this, oh yeah, right, I have to, uh, okay, I should probably not write this low. Uh, so, so, um, so this formula is actually kind of at the heart of the connection that I, I'm going to try to bring home in this lecture, maybe a bit of, of the next one too, uh, this connection between geometry and information. Right? In this formula, you literally add the two things together. Here's geometry, here's information. Now, I probably, it probably seems like I'm using the term information very loosely here, so I should make clear what I mean by those words. Um, so first of all, entropy, just as uh, I think uh, Kyriakos had the formula on the board, uh, the entropy is defined as minus trace rho log rho, where rho is the state of the, of the quantum fields outside of the black hole. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, you have some, um, you have some um, global state, uh, let's call it rho global, which describes the matter fields everywhere, inside and outside the black hole. This can be a pure state, it could be a mixed state, I'm writing it here as more generally so that we can allow mixed states, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, and then um, you can trace over the degrees of freedom inside the black hole and obtain a density operator or density matrix for the exterior. Okay, now at least for finite dimensional bipartite quantum systems, um, this is a very simple operation and if so I'm going to assume that you know, how to, you know how to perform this operation. If not, just look it up. It's like five minutes of your time. Um, 
but it basically means that uh, I'm retaining only the information about the quantum state that pertains to the exterior of the black hole, and I'm throwing away anything I know about the interior. Okay. Um, but it's something you can do, like a computer can do this. Right? It's just, um, so so that's, that's the quantum state that I then feed into this formula for the von Neumann entropy. All right. And what the von Neumann entropy then tells me is basically my deg degree of ignorance about the quantum state. If rho were pure, this would give me zero. I'd know exactly which quantum state I'm in. So uh, this is the sense in which I use the words information and, and entropy uh, exchangeably. So if I give you a box, just to give you a very explicit example, I hand you a box and I tell you that it could be in any one out of n quantum states with equal probability. Okay, so the probability for each state is 1 over n. Well, if you plug that into this formula, you're going to find that the entropy of the box is log n. Right. Um, but if you open the box and figure out which of these n quantum states it is, then you will have received some information. We might have a code, you know. If it's in the first quantum state, it means that I want to go to dinner tonight. If it's in the second quantum state, I, I have a headache, and so on. So, um, so, so by opening the box and looking, you gain information. So in that sense, entropy and information are two sides of the same coin. This, this ignorance that we call entropy is kind of the information you don't yet have, if you want to put a positive spin on it. Yeah? In my, in my simple example, every state had probability 1 over n. Yeah, yeah, so it's very, it's a maximally mixed state. And then, and then after you figure it out, which state it is, and you update the state to the pure state that you found, and now it's a pure state. After you open the box, you find your pure state. Well, so for example, I might, I might know that this is, th these states are all eigenstates of a particular operator that I can measure. Right? I, then I open the box, I measure that operator, and from the eigenvalue, I learn which state it was. And then I update my my knowledge, and now I have, I have a pure state, I have information. Okay, so entropy going down from log n to zero means me gaining that much information. Okay, so that's, that's what I mean by these expressions. But, but just coming back to, uh, to Begenstein, so, so, so that's what, what he was really doing. He was adding literally geometry to quantum information. And so maybe it's not so surprising that those things are, are deeply linked once you accept this step, once you accept that this quantity makes sense. Um, now, the thing about generalized, so, so what, did, what did Beckenstein propose? I never told you his main proposal. His main proposal was the so-called generalized second law. Another thing that goes in a box. Okay, which is just to say that, well, that's, that's the new second law. Okay? In the presence of black holes, you can't expect matter entropy uh, to always go up, but what you can expect uh, is the total entropy, including black hole entropy, uh, to never decrease. Okay? Um, and, and that's, of course, a conjecture. You, you know, he had some right to make it. It was a good idea. And he checked it on a couple simple systems. It seemed to work. Uh, but when you really think about it, it's a very radical conjecture. Um, all that he did right, was take the second law from being obviously violated in the, in the presence of black hole to having a fighting chance. What would have to happen for the generalized second law to be true? Well, what has to happen is that when I add this matter system to the black hole, the black hole grows. by some difference in area that we can call delta area, delta A. Okay. Now, for the second law to work, the generalized second law to work, this delta A in units of the Planck length squared has to be bigger than the entropy that we're losing. This is the entropy that's gained. This is the entropy that's lost. Overall, we want entropy to go up. So delta A has to out, you know, outpace this, this S. Okay. But it's actually pretty crazy to think that that could always be true because what the black hole does depends on things like 
the energy of this, of this system that you add to the black hole, maybe the manner in which it moves across the horizon, it's general relativity, you know, it's, it's geometry shaping itself in response to, to the stress tensor of matter. Right, this is Einstein's equation. What goes here is the expectation value of the stress tensor. How can this equation possibly know how much entropy was in that box? Or at least, how can this equation make sure that the area grows by more than enough to compensate for this entropy? It's OK if it overshoots. That's fine. But it seems like it has to know something about how much entropy there is in the box. That's really, um, that's really quite remarkable. And we can make this sharper. In fact, Bekenstein uh, did make this sharper. So what Bekenstein did is to try to figure out, um, so basically turn, turn this logic around. I mean, once you know, you've got all these successes, you know, black holes have, have uh, they radiate, so you know, you, your conjecture that they have entropy is really beautifully vindicated, everything fits together. It starts making sense to just assume that the generalized second law is true, and then ask, what does it imply? What does it actually uh, tell us about the entropy of matter systems? Okay, and um, so let's turn this around and ask: What does the GSL imply, assuming that it is true? Okay, and so what it implies? Well, you know, there's there's dumb things that I can ask, right? I can take a box that's in a pure state and already has no entropy to start with and kick it in a high arc into a black hole. Well, the black hole area is going to go up. Um, the entropy was zero to start with. Fine, everything's OK. That's not very interesting. What we want to do is try to make the black hole area increase as little as possible holding fixed certain parameters of the matter system. And then use the amount of area increase that we're getting as the absolute minimum that we just can't avoid as an upper bound on the entropy of the matter system. Okay. So uh, let's consider a matter system that for simplicity we'll take to be spherical. At least we'll assume that it fits into a sphere of radius r. And we'll assume that it has mass or energy E. Okay, And then off into the black hole with it. Actually, no, not off into the black hole with it yet. So if I have a matter system far from the black hole and it has energy E, and I throw it into the black hole, then in the end I get a black hole with, with mass M, M plus E, or whatever the original mass of the black hole was. right? So I'm going to throw this into the black hole. Sure, we will, but not from far away. Why not? Well, actually, I didn't have to increase the mass of the black hole by E. That is what happens if I throw the matter system in from far away. But imagine you have a matter system. You're in outer space on some space station or some platform or something, and you're lowering it down. Uh, on a rope towards Earth. Well, Earth's gravity is going to pull on that thing. It's going to pull on your rope, and you can run an engine on that rope. You can extract work by lowering an object down into a potential well. Right. How is that reflected in the conservation of energy? Well, uh, the energy at infinity, the energy as measured by a faraway observer, was the only one that really makes sense. 
the energy at infinity of a matter system that's, that's at rest on the surface of Earth is actually lower than the energy of the same matter system if you take it out into space by a redshift factor. Right. That redshift factor in the Schwarzschild metric is 1 minus 2m over r if your system is at, at radius r. Notice that the redshift factor goes to 0 if I were to lower my system all the way to the horizon of a black hole, which is r equals 2m. Okay. So now it seems like we've hit upon a really good way to add matter to a black hole uh, without it increasing the, the, the black hole mass and therefore in, not increasing the black hole area. Right. We simply lower the matter system, extracting work from it all the while, until it's just right at the black hole event horizon. And then, then we can drop it in without, without increasing the mass of the black hole. So that's the idea. And then we would have violated the generalized second law. So we'll slowly lower um, the system to the event horizon. So that E goes to E times 1 minus 2m over r, uh, and that goes to 0. Okay. And that way we're not adding mass to the black hole. All right. But we can't actually quite do that. So here's a, a big black hole. I'm going to draw just a part of the event horizon. And here's my string. And here's my matter system. That fits nicely into this sphere. So why can't I lower this all the way to the horizon? What's the problem here? Well, I can, right? I can, actually, I can actually lower this until the bottom of the system touches the black hole horizon. I certainly can't lower it any more than that because tidal forces will rip this thing apart. Nothing that actually crosses the event horizon can just kind of stay there. Right? Once you're inside the black hole, you just fall in towards the singularity. Okay, so this is the absolute best I can do. But why doesn't that redshift the energy to zero? Because, the, yeah, the center of mass is still above the horizon. Right. So this, this system, I, I said, has some finite extent r. Okay. So it is, in fact, not the case that I can extract all of the energy as work. The best that I can do is get it roughly a distance r from the horizon and then drop it in. That's still a lot better than throwing it in from, from far away. But it means that I can't just get a trivial violation of the generalized second law by adding absolutely no mass to the black hole but adding entropy to it. That's a nice first check. Okay. Another check that you might have already done in your head is, well, why don't I just make the system smaller? But um, quantum mechanics tells us that if I make the system uh, of size uh, r, it has to have energy at least h bar over r. <coughs> And so, in fact, by making the system smaller, at some point, I'm going to start making the energy bigger. And, I'm, I'm, and at that point, I'll stop gaining anything by doing this. Yeah, you, you may want to check explicitly that this works out in the right way. Okay, so, so there's something quantum about this. It doesn't work if you forget about quantum mechanics. That's obvious since the proposal is quantum mechanical. If I, were, if I was allowed to idealize this as a point, as a mass point, then I could certainly extract all the energy. All right. So the best we can do is this. So we are a proper distance r from the horizon, where r is the system size. OK? And so then it's just a trivial calculation. Uh, by the way, a, a lot of what I'm talking about right now can be found in an old review paper, since I'm not yet talking about rel relatively newer things. Um, 
And so if you want the details of the algebra, you'll find, you'll find it there. But I'll just tell you the answer. So now what we want to know is uh, how much does the black hole area increase in this sort of optimal way, um, if you will, maximally antagonistic to the, uh, to the GSL uh, of entering, of, of adding a system to the horizon. So if I throw, are you asking why don't I throw the ball from far away given that after all I can always think of it as having entered, I just think of the last step where it crosses the horizon when the energy is low. Is that your question? Oh, uh, because, because I'm trying to, I'm trying to challenge the generalized decay law. I'm trying to figure out how to break it. And if I can't break it, what does it tell me about the, the entropy that, that matter has? So the basic idea is I'm trying to make delta A as small as I possibly can. Okay? And then I get to say that delta A is bigger than the entropy of that matter system. And as you'll see, that will be an interesting statement. I'm trying to minimize the area increase, right? Because this, the statement that we're after is S is less than or equal to uh, the entropy of this matter system is less than or equal to this, right? If I believe in the GSL, then this has to be true, right? For any way that I, that I add the matter system to the black hole. But I want this also to be maximally interesting. And for this bound to be maximally interesting, I want the right-hand side to be as small as I can possibly get it to be. And that's what I'm trying to do too with this complicated way of, of this delicate way of adding the matter system. I'm trying to get the most interesting possible constraint that I can. I haven't. I don't. I, I'm not assuming anything at all about the matter system's entropy right now. I'm using the GSL to constrain it. Good. Now I actually need the formula. Yeah, the only thing I've assumed about the system is that it has a certain mass and that it, it fits into a sphere of a certain radius. Okay, so using this optimal uh, delta A minimizing protocol that I just outlined um, gives you the following result. The uh, mass of the black hole increases by this amount. So this is a little bit of algebra that you can find in this paper. You need the metric and all that for it. But it's not hard at all. So here, uh, just to fix notation, this is the mass of the black hole before we throw anything into it, and uh, this is the mass increase as a result of me adding this matter system. And this is Newton's constant, energy of the system, radius of the system. All right, and so now uh, we're home free, everything is easy. Uh, we know that the area is just the square of the radius, four pi r squared, okay? The radius for a simple Schwarzschild black hole is just two gm. Okay, so we can easily translate that into an area increase. So to first order, oh yeah, by the way, I'm assuming that the black hole is extremely large. Okay, so we're gonna assume M is essentially infinite because we'll see that M drops out anyway. And that way we don't have to worry about finite size effects. It really doesn't matter so long as, as the mass of black hole is absolutely enormous compared to E. Okay. And the radius of the black hole very large compared to R, more importantly. Um, okay, so then after this 
bit of trivial algebra, we find that this is how much the area increases. Now, uh, notice that the area increase for the black hole is proportional to Newton's constant. Okay? That means that if we measure it in units of the Planck length square, which means dividing this by GH bar, Newton's constant isn't going to come into it anymore. This result, then, in terms of the entropy increase, is actually independent of the strength of gravity. Okay, and that's very significant. So now all I need to do is divide this by um, divide this by 4 GH bar to get the, the sort of minimal increase in black hole entropy that I really can't avoid. And, um, and what we find is 2 pi ER over H bar, this step you can follow in your head. Okay, so all we're left with now is H bar no more, no more Newton's constant. All right, so now the GSL tells us that, um, well, I wrote it there. It tells us that D is gen is greater than or equal to zero, so that means that um, let's just break S gen up into the two pieces, right? And so we find that ds black hole is greater than or equal to minus the change in the entropy outside the black hole, which is, of course, in our simple example, just uh, the entropy of the system that we lost. Okay? Uh, and so we find, in the end, that S uh, is less than or equal to um, 2 pi ER over H bar. Okay, so important thing about this is no G, no Newton's constant. Um, what this thing relates this is called Bekenstein's bound, so um, he actually made this sort of an explicit proposal in uh, 1981. But it was kind of implicit in his ideas from the early 70s uh, about the generalized second law. So here we have quantum information or entropy on the left hand side, and here we have the energy. And here we have a piece of geometry. So now I think we've made a little bit more precise this surprising and counterintuitive relation that's required by the generalized second law between quantum information and things like energy and geometry, which naively would seem to be insensitive to that type of refined quantum type of quantity. Well, OK, so, so this is. This is, uh, I, this should surprise you. Notice that there's no information about the black hole in this inequality. The black hole was just used and thrown away at the end to get to this result. There's no gravity in here. It's just a statement about ordinary matter. Any questions about this? So it's actually useful to check this for a moment, um, see that it works, more or less. OK. So um, let's consider a ball of radiation at some temperature t. OK, so what do we know about a ball of radiation at a temperature T? Well, the entropy of a ball of radiation is of order R cubed T cubed over H bar cubed. And the energy uh, is of order R cubed T to the fourth over H bar uh, cubed. Okay, just simple thermodynamic formulas. 
there's some constants of order one here, Stefan Boltzmann, blah, blah, blah. But that's the basic, that's the basic uh, result from, from undergraduate thermodynamics. And, um, and so now we can actually see right away um, that this implies, so in the thermodynamic regime, by which I mean here that the entropy is much greater than 1. In other words, the temperature, the, the thermal wavelength is much shorter than the size of the system. Um, you can immediately see that um, the entropy will be much less than ER over H bar. Why? Because ER uh, over H bar, um, as you can see, is simply the entropy to the four thirds power. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm just turning that by considering this right hand side. That's this thing with the threes replaced by four, so it's just the four thirds power of, the, of, the, of this line. Okay? But a number that's much bigger than one, if I take it to four thirds power, gets much bigger still. Okay? And so that's why this is, is clearly true. Okay. But we also see, on the other hand, if the entropy is order one, things get a bit fuzzy. And I mean that both in the physics sense and in the, well, things get a bit ill-defined sense. So. Um, what do I mean by this? So if the entropy is of order 1, we can still think about this ball of radiation, but just crank the temperature all the way down to, to h bar over r, where r is the radius of the ball. Well, in this case, let's, we'll have basically one thermal quantum in the, in, in, the, in the ball of order 1. Let's just consider 1. Like, this could be a photon, OK? Um, let's say it's a single photon wave packet. Wave packet. OK, if you have a single photon, well, it can have two states of polarization. So the entropy is about log 2. Maybe there's more because it can move in different ways if we make the box a bit bigger. But the entropy is going to be of order 1 in this particular regime. Right. And the right-hand side, well, the energy of such a photon wave packet is of order h bar over R, where R is the wavelength now, right? We've, we've arranged things so that the wavelength is as big as the box. And so the right-hand side here is going to be also order 1. So this is interesting. We see that this bound that Bekenstein found by thinking about black holes and dropping stuff into black holes actually gets pretty tight. You might worry about the order one factors here. Maybe it even gets violated. Who knows? Um, for, for, for matter that is utterly low energy, has no gravitational back reaction to, you know, be worth thinking about, has absolutely nothing seemingly to do with gravity. Right, just one little photon. In fact, we could, this argument works no matter what the wavelength of the photon is, so long as the temperature is, is, is 1 over that. So this can be as low energy as you like. Gravity can be as unimportant as you like. And yet it looks like we're running into, you know, we're almost running into this constraint. Maybe we're even violating this bound. You should find that very strange, that we can derive a statement like this from thinking about gravity and then challenge, challenge it and find it's kind of satisfied, but pretty close in quantum field theory. Now, that's nice, but the thing that's not nice is these order one factors that I wasn't able to fix. And that's unlike many other formulas where I'm just being lazy. Um, here, it's actually really hard to fix them because it's just hard to know what you mean by um, the entropy of some finite. So, for example, I can write down a global quantum state. So let me just write down a few things first.
So I'm not really using quantum gravity here, but some kind of semi-classical limit of it. So it's remarkable that these ideas about quantum gravity actually constrain uh, low energy non-gravitational physics. Assuming, of course, that these ideas are correct. Okay. Um, but what was frustrating and remained frustrating for, for several decades, actually, just when things get interesting, just when it looks like we're really you know, getting into a regime where this bound is seriously challenged, it might still work, we'd like to know, you know, is the right, are the right and left inside? Is this like 1.4? Is this, is this 1.3, 1.5? You know, it, it, a lot depends on that. Right? It, it might be both order one, but the bound could be violated. It might be both order one, but the bound could be fine. Um, it's hard to define uh, all three of S, E, and R uh, precisely. Precisely enough to really check things in this regime. Why is this hard? Well, it's not that hard to define what I mean by the entropy if I go about it as follows. I could have a hydrogen atom, and the hydrogen atom could be, let's say I put it in a mixed state, so it's, maybe it's in the ground state, maybe it's in the first excited state. Each of them have some probability, let's say one half. Then the entropy is log two. That's great. But what I'm really talking about is a global state, a hydrogen atom in Minkowski space, some you know, excited state in, 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 in the standard model. Um, and I can make perfect sense of the entropy of that state. I can make perfect sense of the energy of that state. It's just the expectation value of the, of the total energy. But what exactly is the radius? We don't want to say, well, it's infinite, because then the bound is no longer very interesting. But it is, in fact, the case that the weight function of the hydrogen atom has some tails that go out very far. They go out all the way to infinity. So then you really want to say, well, OK, but come on, a hydrogen atom isn't that big. It's like you know the Bohr radius, maybe twice. Well, OK, but that's, a, that's the point here. We don't want to say maybe twice, maybe one and a half. You know, we want a number. And it's not clear where do you draw the line. Conversely, you could start by drawing the line. You could say, well, hey, let me, let me um, define a region of space that I'm going to pay attention to. Okay, I'm going to draw an imaginary sphere, and I'm going to ask about the entropy inside of that sphere. But that's also problematic in quantum field theory. And the reason that it's problematic is that that entropy is actually infinite. Okay, so. Um, so let me first summarize what I said before. So we could fix a global state. Um, and then S and E are well defined. But R is not. Or, so that's idea number one. Idea number two is define a region. Say a sphere of size R. It doesn't really have to be a sphere. We could consider other things. OK. Um, then R is well defined. And maybe E is too, it depends. E could be defined as the integral of the stress tensor over the region.
but S is divergent. And so I need to talk a little bit about that problem. So it's going to be an important problem. Notice that I have sort of subtly flipped into quantum field theory. In the beginning, we were just kind of thinking of, okay, here's a box, it's a thermodynamic system, I don't know, need to know anything about quantum field theory to compute the entropy. But we notice that things get kind of interesting in the regime where, where um, you know, field theory really comes into its own, and so we need to be careful and use that language. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, hang on a sec, this is a bit too noisy. Uh, all right. So if you're saying there's a problem with your system with multiple infinity objects, let's say a black hole itself, so R is T. Yeah, well. There's a D missing somewhere here. Good. Yeah, so first of all, uh, I should say that in the derivation, of this, um, of this bound, um, I was kind of assuming that my matter system that I'm lowering in is not already strongly gravitating. Um, so, so this doesn't really apply very well. This, this, this argument that I made about lowering the system and then dropping in it actually has many subtleties. Um, and I, I warned you against none of them. But one that's fairly obvious uh, is that, and, and I should have said it, uh, is that we want to consider a weakly gravitating matter system to start with. Um, but, yeah, well. What about the gravitational forces that the system creates? If you have a pole that is just above the horizon, it feels divergent in gravitational forces. Yeah, so that could, that's right. So that could make it harder. That could make it harder. And in fact, a lot of the, right, so, so, in fact, a lot of the discussions that people had about whether or not this bound is valid and so on centered on exactly what happens when you get that close to the horizon. And in fact, there are corrections there. Uh, the important ones, the most important ones actually come from the temperature being extremely high near the horizon. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in a little while. Okay, so, so yes, this is, a, this is a cheat. Okay, it's a cheat at many different levels. Um, but, so I might as well say this now. But it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because, because he found something that in the end turned out to be on the right track. And sometimes it's okay to use, to use a, a little cheat if it, gets you in, if it gets you in the right direction. But, but Beckenstein paid a big price for that because there was this huge debate about whether or not this entropy bound actually follows from the generalized second law. It might be true, but still not, you know, the connection that one is trying to make here, one implies the other, might just not be true. And in fact, it's, I think that's actually a correct objection. I, I, I think it's, it's not correct to say that this falls from the general second law. Um, and, and then, of course, the question of whether the bound is actually valid. And I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. So there are no known counterexample to the GSM bound for certain matter systems or whatever? There are no known counterexamples. None known to me. Um, maybe known to others. <laughs> yeah, there, there are no known counterexamples. Uh, and in fact, this bound has been proven, uh, though actually surprisingly recently by Aaron Wall, um, in the regime of perturbative gra uh, gravity. So, so if you can expand in GH bar, so th th basically it's proven for the kind of uh, settings where you throw a system uh, into a black hole that's much bigger than the system. It's not proven for the kind of setting where a star collapses and forms a black hole from a new, okay? So there, Aaron's proof doesn't apply. But still, it, in fact, the kind of setting that I'm discussing here, Aaron, Aaron Wall's proofs apply, proof applies. So the GSL certainly holds in this setting, yeah. That the, oh, M was the mass of the black hole, so, uh, when I was deriving the bound, I was assuming that the black hole is very large. That was just convenient. So if the, if the black hole is finite size, then you, know, you have to worry about how the system deforms the black hole as you're lowering it. And the fact that the, 
you know, system might experience more complicated tidal forces and so on. So, um, well, no, this is not the tightest bound you can derive by this by this uh, somewhat shaky argument. If you're happy with this somewhat shaky argument, you could actually derive a tighter bound um, where you replace R, the circumferential radius of the system, with basically its, its smallest linear dimension. So you try to figure out what, what is the, the smallest distance of a set of plates that you can still fit your systems in between. And uh, instead of 2R in this formula, you would, you would put that dimension in. And that's because not, nothing actually stops you from, like, let's say your system is a, is a slab like this, right? If you lower it to a black hole, what you want to do is, first of all, make it be flat and parallel to the event horizon and then lower it like so. And then that sets how far you can get it before you drop it in. Good. Yeah, so this was, this was a major issue, uh, a cause of a lot of confusion and debate. And fortunately, that's pretty much been resolved, um, but by a rather circuitous way. Okay, so. Yeah, so before I tell you how it got resolved, I'm going to tell you uh, other things that should annoy you about this, about this um, bound. Okay, and uh, here's one. So um, there are apparent counterexamples to it, okay? So here's an example, Casimir energy. Okay, Casimir energy can be negative. The energy density of, the, of a quantum field can be negative in, in finite regions of space, um, which means we can have, you know, if I, if I uh, put a box around that region, I can have energy less than zero in that region. Casimir energy is just one example of that. It's just a fact that in quantum field theory you can write down states which, of course, globally must have positive energy, otherwise the theory wouldn't be stable, uh, but in which locally there are patches of space where the energy density is negative. Why is this an obvious problem? Well, if I define um, the entropy that enters this bound as a von Neumann entropy, that's by definition positive, and so it's already clear that the bound is violated. At least that's how the argument goes. It's a pretty, pretty simple argument. Uh, and then there's something called the species problem. Here we imagine, we, again, we have a box of radiation, let's say, or anyway, some kind of box. Let's say there's just one particle in it. It's a photon. Okay. But let's say that there is a large number n of different kinds of photon. You know, we have different kinds of neutrino, and we have different kinds of quarks, and so on. We could have, we could have different species of photon. It's, there's nothing that stops me from writing down a Lagrangian that has that. In fact, if I make this sphere sufficiently small, so then this thing has very high energies, who knows what kind of particles exist at those high energies? Right. But, um, So uh, say we have n uh, species of photons, then the entropy here is log n, if I don't know which photon it is, which type of photon it is in here. And, but I have only one photon in there, okay? So the energy and the radius don't get affected by cranking up n. I can crank up n as large as I like, thereby making the entropy large while keeping energy times radius fixed. Oh, 
Okay, so um, both of those problems have been resolved, but um, but it's subtle. But it's subtle, and and uh, and the resolution of them really were, was a breakthrough that led to all the recent years' developments in in these areas. Can you run into similar problems allowing for particles with arbitrary high spin? Yeah, any any time you have, that's right, that's right. All that all that's really needed here is the ability to have as mu as many states as you like at fixed energy and 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 size. Okay, so it depends, of course, how these particles behave, and you know. But, but any time you can concoct an example where you can hold E and R fixed and make, and make the number of quantum states large, this seems to have a problem. Because the bound tells you that entropy increase can only be also, you have to increase all the energy. You have to invest energy in this, right? Yeah, exactly. And that connection is sort of the interesting bit, right? Um, so I just realized that I forgot to write a particular formula down. So I'm going to look it up on my phone. Um, but yeah, that, that connection is kind of, that's the mysterious thing, right? That, that's what you want to put your fingers on because it's, in the end, I mean, there's some connection between energy, size of a system, and, and information content that's demanded by black hole thermodynamics and which has no obvious reason for it. At least at this quantitative level, there's no obvious reason for it to, to be related in this particular way from the point of view of quantum field theory. Good. So, um, so the resolution of this problem was really, I think, quite a, quite a triumph. Um, and it was by Cassini in 2008. Is that me? Oh, that's, oh yeah. OK. I got to keep this thing far away. <laughs> Sorry about that. OK, it sounds like one of these Star Wars things. Uh, all right, so Cassini pointed out the following thing. OK, um, well, I should say he was building on work by many people, uh, including, and I'm probably not going to be complete here, Anru Wald. Um, Merolf, Minich, Ross, um, probably Raphael Sorkin. Okay, many people worried about this. Many people put a lot of thought into how to define these quantities. Uh, so did I, actually. I spent, like, I think probably a year of my life trying to make sense of S, E, and R in such a way that they're sharply defined and, and a, a non trivial bound of this form is nevertheless valid. Uh, but I'm not going to put myself into this list because those ideas were really terrible and they didn't go anywhere. Um, and so these guys were probably thinking about this in a better way. Uh, Cassini certainly was. And one key idea, okay, one key idea is what to do about the infinities of the entropy. Now, I haven't even told you very much about this yet. Well, why is the entropy of a region infinite? So first of all, they go for option two, OK? You go for option two, you say, I'm going to restrict to some region of radius r. And I'm going to talk about the quantum state in that region. Similar to, OK, I have, I have a global quantum state. I'm going to restrict to the exterior of the black hole, for example. Here, I'm going to draw the region as an interior of something. But it doesn't matter. The whole point is just that you throw away the information about one, one part of space and keep the rest, OK? And that gives you some density operator. So rho equals trace uh, rho global, where you trace over this region. Okay. And um, so this is the radius. Um, now, when I compute trace rho log rho for, of this thing, so if I compute the von Neumann entropy, I actually get a divergence. Why do I get a divergence? So minus trace rho log rho is given by, well, you get a divergence which is the leading, or, or the leading divergence is proportional to the area 
of this surface, this is now not necessarily a black hole, it's just any old surface, um, in units of your cutoff length squared. So if you put the theory on a lattice, epsilon would be the, the distance between lattice sites. Okay. Why is this true? Well, it's true for the following reason. Whatever your state is globally, and a part of it in here, this could be, again, a ball of gas, it could be a washing machine, it doesn't really matter. Um, at sufficiently short distances, a finite energy state looks like the vacuum, or else it wouldn't be finite energy. Okay, now the vacuum has a funny property, that if I draw a line somewhere, this is not a space-time diagram, just spatial. Okay. And I consider sort of wave packets that are close to this, to this surface, this, on one side and the other, it doesn't really matter what wavelength they have, um, so long as their distance from the surface is comparable to their wavelength. In the vacuum state, these pairs are, are highly entangled. Another way of saying that, which is much more precise, is that if you take the global vacuum, okay, and you write it in this perverse way, as um, a, a, in terms of, of, of modes of the quantum fields with support only on the right and modes only, support only on the left, then you find that it is a highly entangled state. By entangled, I mean that it is of the form Um, so, the entanglement between quantum systems is easy, most easily uh, described for qubits. So, a qubit is a quantum system that has two states, zero and one. Now, what we need is two qubits, okay, and an entangled state of two qubits is. Um, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Of course, there's a whole basis of the um, four-dimensional Hilbert space of states of this form. There's also 0, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, 1, plus 1, 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, plus uh, 0, 1, and so on. So these are two systems, A and B. And this is one example of an entangled state. Okay? Entangled means that if I only have one system, uh, I, I don't have a pure state even if the total state is pure. Okay. Um, in this example, they're maximally entangled. I could have an example where um, I make this, uh, you know, I, I, I put some coefficients here, a and b. And if, if a and b are both non-zero, this is still an entangled state. It's just not what's called maximally entangled. In the maximally entangled case, where these coefficients are both 1 over square root of 2, uh, and I'm not going to write them down. Uh, it means that if I have only system A, it's, it's in a maximally mixed state, and the entropy of system A by itself is log 2. Okay. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, because the vacuum is like that. Okay. The vacuum has the property that these two modes are actually entangled, in the sense that, well, it's not quite the same form, right? The state is of the form... Um, I left, I right, uh, with some prefactor to the I. So I here is the occupation number. Of the mode. So by, by left and right, I'm, I'm referring to these modes which are localized entirely on, on the left or entirely on the right of the surface. And if I write the vacuum like so, then um, there's some prefactor uh, that I don't know, uh, maybe this. Um, that, that, that the point here being that this is pretty close to this state. If you just truncate this at occupation number one, so you just take zero and one, um, well, then up to this factor here, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay. So it's actually not terrible to think of qubits. Okay. Except that there's lots of them. There's these modes, and they're also here, right? At every, at every place on this dividing area, there's modes of all wavelengths that are in this manner entangled. There's even tinier ones. Look, here they are. They're also entangled like this. And even smaller ones, and so on. So that's why there's this divergence proportional to the area and units of the cutoff. You can basically just think of tiling your, your, um, 
or discretizing, you're dividing area into a lattice, and then at every lattice site there's entanglement in this, in this way. Okay. Um, and there are subleading divergences. And then usually there are finite pieces. Right? So for example, if in here I have a washing machine that's well localized to the interior of the sphere, then this is you know, our usual entropy of the washing machine will appear somewhere in there. Okay, that's great, but what do we do about these divergences? With a divergence like this, it seems like if I keep it and I don't do anything about it, this entropy bound is clearly violated since the entropy is infinity. Now what I want to say is that this divergence is just the entanglement entropy of the vacuum. It has nothing to do with the matter system, which happens to be a washing machine that I put there. It's the thing that's always there. But it wasn't clear how to make that happen in a mathematically rigorous way. What if it's not a washing machine? What, what if it's a wave packet, a photon wave packet about this size? What do I say then about the entropy? Right? Then it's not so clear which part of this, of, of this expression comes from the wave packet of the photon and which part is, you know, how do you disentangle these things? Yeah? When you say this problem with the entanglement entity diverging, it's just the same problem with this quantum field theory making the same neural signals for infinite amount of information? Um, no, it's, it's, it's not, I would say it's not, um, no, I would say it's not the same problem. Um, it, it's, uh, I think what you're trying to get at, which is that, that these the related entropy bounds are also in conflict with the idea that we sort of have this extensive amount of information in quantum field theory, and that's a very important insight. But, um, but that's not the issue here. That's not the issue here. The issue is that we're getting, at least I don't see an obvious relation. Maybe there is one. Um, the, the, the problem is getting rid of these infinities in a rigorous way, not just by you know, saying, well, I don't like them because they have to do with the vacuum. Um, and, and the key idea that, that um, again, that Cassini had based on this earlier work is, and this is an idea that works only for weakly gravitating systems, is you simply compare the entropy uh, to that you would have if you were in the vacuum state. So you consider two global states. Global state with wa washing machine, global state without washing machine. Starting from the first state, you compute a density operator in this manner. You trace ov over the region you're not interested in and keep the region you like. And you compute a divergent von Neumann entropy from that. Then you repeat the same thing with the second state, which doesn't have a wash washing machine, it's just a global vacuum. And you again trace out the region that you don't like, keep the region you like, and again, computer von Neumann entropy, which is also divergent. And the difference will be the entropy of, what you, of, of the washing machine, or whatever you put there. Okay. And the nice thing about that prescription is that it will give you a mathematically rigorous answer, even for the photon wave packet, where we don't have, you know, we don't, we don't already know what we want to get. It's clear what we want to get for the washing machine, but for the photon wave packet, it was not clear. And it's the photon wave packet where we can actually try to challenge the bounds. So that's, that's kind of important. So this is called vacuum subtracted entropy. At least I call it that. I'm not sure because he needed it. But anyway, um, so, so we start with rho global. Then we trace. We get rho for the region. Okay, and then we compute uh, the entropy of rho, which has this divergence. Okay, now starting from the global vacuum, which I'm going to write as a density operator just to be consistent with this notation. Um, again, we're going to trace. We're going to get some other density operator for the region. Okay, and then compute its von Neumann entropy, which is going to have the same divergences. Um, but then the dot, dot, dot will be different, okay? And so what we're going to compute is delta S, which is which 
which is this, the difference of two von Neumann entropies. Okay, now it's not obvious that this is well defined, but you can show that it is. In other words, it, you, you might have worried that the divergences don't actually cancel and so on, but you can, you can, you can show that, that they do. Um, so this is finite, uh, well defined, and it reduces. to the intuitive answer when we have one. Now, um, Cassini went a lot further than just saying that. In fact, that, that idea was kind of already there in the, in the work by, by Merov et al. He went a lot further. He actually proved a version of, of Bekenstein's bound. And it's important to say the words a version of, because after all, this bound is too vague to prove it. Okay. But now he was able to actually prove it within, within uh, quantum field theory. So now is when I actually need my phone. So I get all the minus signs right. Um, it's, it's really remarkably simple. So I'm sorry for this, but uh, here we go. Um, so Cassini considered, just to be specific, uh, what's called the Riddler wedge. He, he, he took this region not to be the interior of a sphere, but to be simply one side of an infinite plane in Minkowski space. Okay. That's called a Riddler wedge because there's a space-time uh, it looks like it kind of looks like this. So, so here is all of space. I'm drawing only one dimension out of the three. Every point in this diagram represents an infinite plane. Okay, so here is a particular infinite plane that we're using to divide space into two halves. And then we can define modes here, which kind of look like this, um, and modes that have support only on the left. Um, which are these Rindler modes that I, I caricatured here by writing down these blobs, but these are really modes with some large extent. And these modes basically propagate inside these wedges. So the right Rindler wedge is considered is this region here. Okay. Um, so if you use these modes, you can only describe this particular space-time region. If you use the right set of modes with the left set of modes, you can derive, describe this region. Okay. But you can do all of the things that I just talked about. You can have a global state of your quantum fields in Minkowski space. You can trace out the left Rindler wedge. And then you're left with a state rho here in the right Rindler wedge of the quantum fields. And that rho is the thing that has these divergences. Okay. Um, but if I, you know, compute vacuum subtracted entropy, uh, and I should have given it a name, so we're going to call it delta S, um, then, then I'll get something finite. Okay, so that's the particular setting he was working in. Um, and, and he observed the following statements. Okay, and I'm just going to write down a bunch of formulas, uh, and then we'll see what these formulas mean. So, in fact, for these two states, sigma and rho, oops, you can define something called a relative entropy. Um, and I will give you the definition in just a moment. But this is Cassini's observation. This is the key point. Okay. Um, so here are the definitions. So I'm going to need to define all three of these quantities that appear here. So the relative entropy between any two quantum states, this doesn't have to be in quantum field theory, and it is not necessary that, that one of them is the vacuum, um, is given by um, trace, rho log rho, so this is minus of von Neumann entropy, uh, minus trace rho log sigma. Okay. 
Okay, what does this mean, measure? The relative entropy measures the distinguishability of two states. Uh, roughly, you know, if, if you're guessing incorrectly that, that, that it's one of the states, how many times do you have to measure until you discover that you made an error? Okay. Uh, so, so the relative entropy has a bunch of properties that I'll get to in a moment. But right now it's just a definition. It's, it comes out of quantum information theory. Um, then we have the vacuum subtracted entropy, which I've already defined right here. And then we have what's called the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian, or maybe modular energy for short. Um, so this modular energy is defined as follows. I'm going to talk about the, the modular energy is defined with respect to a quantum state. Okay, in most applications, it will be the quantum, the quantum state will be the vacuum, but not in all of them. In, in this particular case, we will take it to be the vacuum, but the vacuum reduced already to the region that we like, so the sigma, okay? And, and this, um, this modular Hamiltonian operator is uh, defined as e to the minus k sigma um, over trace, e to the minus k sigma. That, is, that has to give you the vacuum. So it's kind of the log of the vacuum, if you want. Okay, so this, this has to be there so that this is a density operator with, with, uh, um, whose trace is one. Okay. This is an operator equation I should emphasize. Okay. Um, and then what I meant by delta k here is, is just the trace of k rho minus uh, the trace of k sigma. So it's kind of a vacuum subtracted modular energy. Right. Yeah? What uh, did I think about k sigma? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, this is a, that's a very good question. Um, and the reason that I haven't yet used the fact that we're in Riddler space, all of these definitions are completely general. Um, and I could just say, well, k sigma is kind of the log of the density operator. But that is not a very physical uh, statement. We'll see what k sigma becomes in this specific example. But I should emphasize that in a general setting, um, k sigma is a highly non-local operator. It's not you know, the integral of some energy density or something nice like that. And why should it be? I mean, the, the, uh, the density operator sigma can be very complicated. And, you know, this is the log of that. It could be a mess, and it very, very often is. Okay. Uh, but let, let me just, let me get to that in a moment. Um, yeah? Uh, this is uh, slightly confusing, uh, delta k. Uh, is there supposed to be a k uh, subscript rho uh, times... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So I'm trying to put it, okay. I'm trying to put these sigmas here. Yeah, thank you. And I, I guess for consistency, I should have put a sigma here too, but I didn't want to have too many indices. Um, so I'm going to remind you only that this is the modular uh, Hamiltonian with respect to sigma in these definitions, and then forget about it. OK. So, so this is actually a mathematical identity, which is very easy to prove. In other words, once I've given you this formula for delta S, this formula for delta k, and this formula for the relative entropy, it's two lines to check that, that this equation is true. You can kind of see they all have the same ingredients in it, but you know, I invite you to, to check it yourself. So this is obviously true. Uh, what's the, the interesting part is connecting it to physics. Okay. So um, when we work specifically in Rindler space, it is in fact possible to find the modular Hamiltonian operator, and it is what's called the Rindler energy. Notice, I, I, if, you guys, if any of you guys have like, studied algebraic quantum field theory, we're like getting ourselves deep into that. Okay? And that, that's kind of what was missing from the analysis of these. It turns out, you know, there's a law that, that the thing that you need for your work is always the one you hate the most. That's that's what happened to me many times, but especially in this context. I mean, I never thought I'd have to learn anything about algebraic quantum field theory, but here we are. Um, and um, yeah, 
So, so in the Rindler wedge, you can show that delta k is given by 2 pi over h bar. And I'm not going to show this. OK, I'm just going to tell you it's true. Integral over all of space. If this is the x-axis here, then it is going to be the integral over the stress tensor weighted by the distance um, from, from the uh, plane that divides space into two pieces. Okay, and I'm writing this down only for this particular slice because that's all I'm going to need. So it's, uh, it looks very, well, it's, it's, it's not a very covariant expression, but so what? Okay, so think of it like this, right? If I didn't have this x here, this would simply be the total energy. Uh, so we're integrating, of course, only over x greater than 0. This would be the total energy of the matter on the right side of our dividing surface. right? Uh, but with this x there, it means that uh, if I put my washing machine here, it will contribute twice as much than if I, can, if I put it there. Okay. So this actually is something that we can uh, find a, an intuitive uh, Uh, interpretation for, and then in particular, uh, if we have one isolated ma matter system like a washing machine, far from the dividing surface, and this matter system has energy E, then delta K is just 2 pi over h bar um, times e times that distance of the matter system. Let's say we call that r. So here's my distance r of my washing machine from the plane at x equals 0. Um, so then the modular energy, or Rindler energy in this case, is just exactly what appears on the right-hand side of Bekenstein's bound. Yeah, so rho is, is in here when you compute the stress tensor. And then uh, sigma also enters because you have to do the same thing twice. right? Delta k is defined by this formula. So you have to repeat the exercise with sigma, and that's necessary to get something. From. I'm sorry? The, the, the delta k that I wrote there. Thank you. Oh, uh, I don't think so. Yeah, sorry. I, I may have said something wrong. But um, I mean, so, so, the, so the question is how I regulate this, right? If I'm careful to regulate my stress tensor to start with, then, then this contribution is just going to be 0, right? Because the, the stress tensor in the vacuum should be 0. Uh, but what I've written down here is, has the property that it's not going to matter how I regulate my stress tensor, because whatever, whatever divergences I left around are going to be canceled out when I subtract the vacuum contribution. Thank you. Yeah, so this is very unusual. Normally, this is a horrible mess. So this is very special to Rindler space. This is why we're considering Rindler space. <laughs> OK, uh, so, so in, in general, uh, well, for free theories, it, it's at least uh, uh, a double integral. And it, it, it's, 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 yeah, the, there's no reason right, why, why this should be a simple operator and local. So in general, it's not. Here we get lucky. OK, um, yeah. Oh, maybe two minutes. Yeah. Um, so, so good.
Actually, maybe five. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let me, get, let me get to the main punchline here. Um, what does this have to do with anything? Well, um, there's a general result, which is that the relative entropy is never negative. Okay, this is just something that somebody proved in the 70s in quantum mechanics. Okay, and it's true. Okay, so it's just a mathematical statement. But that means that when we look at the definition here, delta S is less than delta K, which is precisely Bekenstein's bound in situations where we know intuitively what E and R mean. But now we have finally what we wanted. What Cassini did here is, first of all, formulate the Bekenstein bound in a manner like so, which is always completely well defined, and prove it, and have it reduce an appropriate limit to a statement that we like. So that was really pretty awesome. Okay. And uh, I guess I'll have to talk next time uh, about how, how uh, he gets around the species problem, because it's, 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 a, very interesting, it's a very interesting result. So I'll, I'll wait uh, until tomorrow with that. Thanks.